Christian. So that's what we're here today <clears throat> is to talk about doing Christian things. Now, we're, we're speaking specifically on John G. Lake's Secrets of Divine Healing. So I'm going to give a couple of them. There's actually 15 that I have gleaned from his works and the things that he himself said you needed to know to be able to see the sick healed. And people say, what, what do you mean the secrets and how does that work? And you know, I thought it was just the anointing of God. Well, honestly, you either thought wrong or been taught wrong, one of the two, because it's not just um, God just, God didn't wake up in the morning and lean over the balcony of heaven and go, well, let me see, who can I dump a little anointing on today? Oh, he's been good for a couple of weeks. I'll give him, it ain't the way it works. God gives his spirit. He has more faith in you than you do. He believes that you're going to line up. He believes that you're going to be conformed to the image of Christ. He has pure faith in you that you're going to be who he created you to be. And my job here, <clears throat> honestly, is very simple. All I have to do, see, I'm not even here to give you anything. I'm here to show you what you already have. And see, I'm not going to try to sell you anything in the sense of, well, you know, if you can get this special anointed cloth or anointed oil, none of that. Because I can tell you, I didn't need any of it. And we're seeing the sick healed every day dramatic things. I could go into testimonies and actually plan on doing some testimony sessions and episodes in the future. But I just wanted to emphasize that you've got what you need and his name is Jesus. That's it. We lift up him, not even Dr. Lake. All Dr. Lake was was a man who gave us some information that helped us see the right direction. And so he was a godly man. There was He did a lot of good things, but it all comes back down to Jesus. If it's not about Jesus, this is a wasted program and everything we do is, pro is wasted. So I want to emphasize always that you may not have John Lake with you. You may not have his anointing or his mantle or anything else. But what you do have is you have the Jesus of John Lake. And if you have his Jesus, then you can do what John Lake did because all John Lake was doing was what Jesus did. So let's just skip all the middlemen, get back to the source, and let's get with Jesus and do what we're supposed to do, do what he called us to do. Amen? All right, let's look at this. First one, I'm going to just run through them. Like I said, we're not going to be able to go into them in depth. We actually have a teaching on that that I think they're going to tell you about a little bit later on in the program. But the first one is called, that Dr. Lake said we need to do, was to destroy the sacred cows concerning sickness, healing, and God's power. Now, honestly, that can take a bit because we have developed so many and there's new ones being developed all the time uh, because people get tired of paying for the old ones so they have to create new ones to get you your money. So, uh, one of the best ways to uh, get all these sacred cows concerning healing and the power of God destroyed, uh, the fastest way, honestly, is just to attend the DHT. It's a divine healing technician training that we do, because in that we go through all of them and just one by one just, just destroy them. And uh, when we get done, you can walk in the power of God, simple as that. By the way, I'll let you know that all of our meetings are free, uh, free attendance. There's no charge for attendance. Uh, we do ask that you pre-register, but it really... Uh, the main thing is we're trying to get this information out there and get you to walk in the power of God. Uh, to be very honest with you, when you walk in the power of God, you become a target for the enemy and everybody that works with him. And uh, so really, when I walk in the power of God, it's a normal thing. But at the same time, I want you to walk in the power of God. And you think, well, that's mighty nice of you, Craig. Not really. It's uh, self-preservation. Yeah, I figure if I can get you to be as good a target as I am, then maybe the enemy will be looking at you instead of always trying to take me out. So anyway, just, uh, you know, just trying to share, share the love, right? Okay, all right, let's move on. Do you have to destroy the sacred cows concerning power, sickness, healing, all these different areas. And like I said, there's several of them. We've got about 30 or so of them just listed. But um, we're not going to go into those sacred cows today. We did some of that on the last program by having to have faith for yourself or can somebody else have faith for you and all these different things. Basically, everything you've been taught about healing, it's just wrong, all right? I, I hate to, well, no, I don't hate to say that. Actually, I'm kind of glad to say that because you'll come into truth. But almost everything you've ever learned about healing, all the lines of authority and how people have to line up and all the, all the little, little things that get in the way of healing, that, that hindrances. You know, as I said, I think on one of the earlier programs that the only hindrance to healing is the fact that you believe there are hindrances to healing. And so... All the because I've proven them. I, everything that you think I have to do to see the sick healed, I have not done on purpose, and yet still seen the sick healed. I have uh, seen the sick healed without fasting. I've seen the sick healed without long hours of prayer beforehand. All all these things that I'm gonna, I'm just really going to shock you here. When I first started, I saw the sick healed while there was absolute sin in my life. I was still sinning, knew I was sinning. Pretty much everybody around me knew I was sinning. 
and yet the sick were still getting healed. Now, you know, boy, that'll mess up some theology right there, but it's a fact. And the fact is that after a period of time, <clears throat> I was still sinning and still, I mean, we saw people come out of wheelchairs and amazing things happen with sin in my life. And finally, I just went to God and I said, man, doesn't sin matter at all? All the stuff I've been taught, doesn't that matter? Does, does it matter if I sin or not? And right then God spoke up and he said, <clears throat> yes, and I will deal with you later. And when he said that, I always tell people, shortly after that, this, this real desire for holiness just seemed to come over me and I wanted to, uh, uh, the, the sin just started kind of falling away after that. But the fact was is that righteousness, you're made righteous in Christ, but if there's sin in your life, what counts in healing is what you believe when you minister to that person. If you can't believe at that moment that that person in front of you, that God can heal that person in front of you right then of whatever they have, they're not going to get healed. But if you can believe that, then they're going to get healed. Because it's what you're believing when you pray that counts. Not all the other things. As a matter of fact, Jesus even said, there's going to be people that come to him and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we do all these mighty works, cast out devils, heal the sick, all these things in your name. And he's going to say, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. Now, you can't get around that. There, people say, well, they were all lying. I have a hard time believing anybody's going to stand before Jesus at the judgment throne and lie. Let me tell you, at that point, all truth is going to be known. There are people, and Jesus even said himself, why do you call me Lord, Lord, and don't do the things that I tell you to do? And so there are people that are healing the sick, that they're sinning in their life and don't even know God. And you say, well, how can that happen? They believe that God can heal. Simple as that. See, just because a person gets results doesn't mean you ought to believe their doctrine. You ought to believe their doctrine whenever you can line it up with the Bible. Not just because they have some gift. It's one of the problems in the church. Some celebrity gets saved and next Sunday we got them behind the pulpit preaching and pretty soon they fall or commit some major sin and then we look at them and we, we get mad at them because they we think they let us down when in reality they should have never been put in that position. The Bible says not, not to put a novice into a position of authority and we do it anyway because we know if we have a celebrity's name on the marquee we'll draw a crowd. And so once again it's chasing that dollar rather than obeying the Word of God. So now number two we're really moving along here. Number two, you have to recognize sickness and disease as an enemy. You say, well, Kurt, that's, of course, it. well, believe it or not, most people don't see it that way, especially Christians. We, most Christians will end up teaching you that, well, God is using that sickness to teach you something. Well, God is, he, that, that sickness or disease is bringing you closer to Him. It's purifying your character. Funny, none of these things Jesus ever said. And when you go back and you say, now, now think about this, because I'm going to hit this pretty strong. When you say that God is using that sickness to teach you something. Now, if you go into the Bible, the only thing that you find in the Bible about someone or something teaching you, it says that the Holy Spirit is your teacher and that He will teach you, He will guide you, He will lead you into all truth. So whenever you say that this sickness or disease is teaching you or guiding you or leading you into truth, what you're actually saying is, that that sickness is equivalent to the Holy Spirit. Now, that's really dangerous because what you're saying is that the Holy Spirit is a spirit of infirmity or a spirit of sickness. And you are giving credit to the devil, or I should say giving credit to God for what the devil is doing. Now, that's really close to what the Pharisees did when they said that Jesus cast out devils, you know, by, by Beelzebub, the prince of devils, when in reality it was the Holy Spirit. And he told them, he said, you... You're, you're fixing to blaspheme the Holy Ghost, and if you do, there's no forgiveness. So you need to realize when you start saying that God is using sickness or disease to teach you as though He sent it for a purpose to teach you, you are absolutely outside the grounds and the boundaries of Scripture. And if you say that, whoever you say it to, I'll just be blunt, you're lying to them. Because God is the, the, the person who heals and delivers and sets free. He's not the oppressor. He, he's not guilty of child abuse. He is the one who gave his son so that by his stripes you can be healed. So, now let's move on. I get fired up on this stuff because it just, well, I just believe I have the heart of God on it. So it's what it is. Number three, get fed up. Now this, now I'm, I'm from Texas and so I'm just speaking to you just blunt. 
at some point, you have to get fed up. Until you get fed up, nothing changes. Until you got fed up with sin, you stayed in it. Matter of fact, many of you are probably still in it right now. It's because you hadn't got fed up with it. You play with it. You play around with it. See, most people never divorce sin. They just kind of separate from it. And every now and then, they want to go back and date it. And you, you have to divorce it. You have to kill it in your life. So you have to get fed up. Number four, you have to treat all sickness the same. You don't treat cancer one way and a headache a different way. It's all an enemy to be sought out and destroyed. Now, obviously we're only number four and I'm definitely not getting into in-depth teaching. Like I said, we're going to have uh, think something that you can uh, purchase at some point to find out more about these. Where we go into in-depth teaching on each, on each one of these points because you need to know this. These are the things that Dr. Lake said you need to know to get the sick healed. So, Number five, treat all sickness like a person. Now, Smith Wigglesworth also said this. He said that you have to treat the devil like it was a person or a personality. And it's the same thing with all sickness and disease. You have to treat it. He said to treat cancer like the devil himself. And so you have to do that. You have to look at this sickness not as part of this person, but as an enemy sent from hell to kill, steal, and destroy this person's life. And whenever you see this, you'll start to develop a hatred for it. And, you know, you can walk through children's hospitals, you can walk through various other places, hospitals, things like that, and look at what the enemy has done on the bodies of these innocent children and, and adults too. But you can see what it's done. And if you can walk through there without just getting mad and saying, this isn't right and it shouldn't be this way, then you're already dead and don't even know it. Because you have to be able to walk through. And if you walk through a children's hospital, I don't know how a Christian could ever walk to a children's hospital and see the, the ravaged bodies of these little babies and children and yet look at that and say, well, that's the loving hand of a God that is trying to do something. You know, well, and oh, here's, here's the, kind of getting back for a minute on the killing sacred cows. Just let me say, if you're a preacher or a minister and you're telling parents that their baby is born crippled, deformed, or some type of illness because of some sin the parents had, let me tell you, just go ahead and resign from ministry and get out of it and don't ever say it around me because the old man might rise back up and I just might have to slap you, you know, pull a General Patton type of thing on you because honestly, you're just a liar. You have no business in ministry. You shouldn't even be there if you're going to tell parents who are already hurting, crying, and would do anything to trade places with their baby. And you're going to tell them that their child's deformity or problem is because of a sin you committed? Then you need to go back and read the Bible. Read Ezekiel chapter 18. And don't ever say that again, because that does away with all that generational curse garbage that's going around. It's a lie from the devil meant to keep people in bondage. And you need to go study Ezekiel 18, study the whole chapter, and it says in there, you will never again use this proverb that the children's, that the uh, parents' father's sins will come down to the children. But see, that's exactly the type of garbage that's being propagated amongst Christianity today. And what it is, it's an industry meant to sell books and sell seminars. And you have to go through all these things where you make money, or somebody's making money, off of you so you can be free. Jesus already paid for your freedom with his blood, and that's enough. And you don't need to be trying to pay some man to get free. I, I'm telling you, you write, you call, you email, you want to know more, get into one of the seminars. I'll be glad to talk with you. I'm there during the breaks. We talk, we fellowship. I ask uh, the people ask questions. I try to answer them the best we can. But I'm telling you, God loves you. He sent his son to die for you for two reasons. It says in, in Psalm 103, don't let us forget all of his benefits. He forgives all of our iniquities and heals all of our diseases. God wants you well, and he doesn't want you in hell. And it's that simple. And he gave his son so that you don't have to live in either. And so... If there's any questions about this, you write us. I have Bible for everything I'm saying. And I would challenge any person to refute the things that you hear on this program. You think you got something? You write it out. You send it to me. But I guarantee you, I've been doing this for a time. I've studied. Hey, I tried to tear this message apart all myself. Uh, if I could find a way out, I wanted to take it. It's not easy coming in with an absolute message of victory. Especially whenever you're pretty much uh, contradicting everything that's been said. And tends to stir up a lot of enemies. But then I realized that Jesus also had a lot of enemies. And the funny thing was, all his enemies were religious people, usually religious uh, leaders. So I guess I'm in good company uh, whenever it comes to that. So, next, number six, 
Command, not beg. So that's one of the main things, and I'm going to give you some, uh, not today, but in, at, at a future time, I'll be giving you some letters that was written by Dr. Lake, where he literally says, when we learn to command instead of beg, and instead of interceding for the sick, we started seeing results. That's the key. You are, see, you have to realize when people look at, at the Bible, they will, especially the Gospels, they will identify with usually one of three people, usually actually one of two. They will identify with usually the sick person coming to be healed. Or if they are advanced at all in any spiritual matters, they will identify themselves with the disciples. But I'm telling you that you have to realize that the people that were sick were not born again. And the people that were Jesus' disciples at that point were not born again. They didn't have the Spirit of God dwelling in them. That makes you different than them. And you are totally different. The only example you have in Scripture is Jesus. He was the only one that had the Spirit the way you do. And you need to realize that, that He is your example. So you are not to be calling out to Him to heal. He said, believers will lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. He told his own disciples, you go, you heal the sick. He didn't say, go pray for the sick to be healed. He said, you heal the sick, you raise the dead, you cast out devils. He gave them authority. So you need to start talking like you have the authority. You need, first off, you need to believe it. But you need to talk like it. And you, do, you need to start commanding instead of asking God to do it for you. God, See, you're doing it for God. Do you get that? You're, God sent you to set people free for him because he's not here in the flesh. So you're doing it for him, and yet here you are trying to get him to do it for you. Backwards Church, name of the program, right? You have to realize that you have authority and you need to go and act like Jesus would act, talk like Jesus would talk, and get ready for persecution that Jesus would receive, because it's coming for you. Because religious leaders and, you see, the world will love you because you're gonna heal their babies and set their people free and, and you're not gonna condemn them, you're gonna bring them out of their hurt. But the religious world will hate you. Why? Because you're going to start raising people up, setting them free, and getting them to realize that they don't, there is no middleman between them and God. That you teach them to walk with God themselves, and they don't need a middleman. That's old covenant, the one we had to, have, had to go to the prophets, had to go to the priest and get things done for us. The new covenant is this, that we have a living Savior who lives within us, who takes away the barrier the veil that was between us and God and connects us with him directly. Now you can pray to God, talk to God, and speak for God. You don't have to have anybody else between you and God anymore. And so we wanted to, to emphasize these points. Now, let's go back here. Number seven, and some of these you probably heard quite a bit here, especially in the areas of speaking, because number seven is this. Speak to the problem and not to other people about the problem. See, that's, that's a big one. And most of you have probably already heard this. <clears throat> but you need to realize that you have to talk to the thing. Jesus said you speak to the mountain. You tell the mountain what you want it to do. Whenever you minister to the sick, and all these things are taught during the DHT, the Divine Healing Technician training that we do, but whenever you are ministering to a person, you're not talking to God. When they come up to you to be ministered to, you are, that's, you've already talked to God, and God's already talked to you through His Word. He said you heal the sick. That's it. You've already talked to God about His, uh, His viewpoint on sickness or disease, by his stripes, they're healed. So your job now is not to talk to God when they're in front of you. When they come up to you, your job is to simply speak to their body, tell it what you want it to do. In other words, if the leg isn't working, you say, leg, in the name of Jesus, I command you to work, to function normally. Just give you an idea. It's not a formula. Just give you an idea. Uh, you can also speak and say if it's cancer. You would speak to them along these lines. Again, don't get into formulas. You know as well as I do, formulas don't work. It is, you can say, now understand, I believe in the power of words and confession. I believe in all that. But you have to realize that it's what you're believing that counts even more than what you're saying. Because what you're saying generally will line up with what you're believing, but it's not what you say that counts. See, you got to get this. Now listen carefully. It's not what you say that counts. It's who says it. It's the fact that you are connected to God, that He listens to you. See, when a Christian speaks, Heaven hears an ob and, and well, let me say it this way. Whenever a Christian speaks a word, a word of command to a sick body or anything else, when a Christian speaks, heaven hears and agrees. Whatever you bind on earth, be bound in heaven. Whatever you loose on earth, be loosed in heaven. But now, whenever a Christian speaks, 
Heaven hears and agrees. Hell hears and obeys. You need to get that. You need to realize that very thing right there, that whenever a Christian speaks, it's not so much what you say, it's the fact of who you are that's saying it, that you are connected to God and He will back you up. So get away from, from formulas. But whenever it's, for instance, if you're going to speak to a person who had cancer, well, of course, you're going to lay hands on them, but you're also going to say something along these lines. This is what we usually say, something along these lines, in the form of, all right, in the name of Jesus, cancer, I break your power. I command you now, leave this person, leave their body. We command every cell, every tissue, every organ that's been affected to right now to be healed and restored. Spirit of cancer, I break your power. Spirit of fear of cancer, I break your power, and I command you to go now in Jesus. Now you see, you say, why did you get loud? Because it's forced. You got just like you would talk to a dog. You stomp your foot and say, go. If you just Wigglesworth made this statement, if you just stood there and said, well, puppy, leave, he's going to stand there and wag his tail. Well, the devil's the same way. That's like asking the devil, oh, oh, oh devil, you know, please go. Please. He's going to say no. You don't ask him, you tell him. Can't You say, well, you're saying cancer is a devil? Yeah, what do you think it is? The devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy? What does cancer do? Steal, kill, and destroy. It's all in the same family, John 10.10. 10, it's one side or the other. See, that's your problem. You think, well, no, you don't understand. It, it's, it's just simply cells. Out of, no, 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 no. That's the result of the spirit being there. And you have to break that thing, cast it out, and then lay hands and command healing and command them to be free. And then you say, in the name of Jesus, you go and never return. Well, you can't tell it never to return. Yeah, yeah, I just did. And Jesus did too. He told it, told the spirit one time, leave the boy and never enter into him again. See, that's another lie that you bought, that you can't tell these things and never return. And as long as you do that, that's why they tell you, when you get healed of cancer, you all, you're not out of the woods for five years. Why? Because it could come back. What if they tell you that? What are they doing? They're building up fear and you're going to walk around in fear for five years. And the first time you feel a pain, oh, I wonder if that's cancer. And it's right back. And you took it. So that's why we break the spirit of fear of cancer. So these are just some ideas and just some, some of the different points and things that we hit in the DHD. But command, not beg. Speak to the problem, not about the problem. Now, next one. <clears throat> you must see people as oppressed prisoners of war. Now, this gets back to healing as warfare. You see... Whenever, a while ago I said whenever you stand in, when a person stands in front of you, you're going to minister to them, that you're not talking to God, and, and I agree with that, that you're not talking to God whenever they're standing in front of you. But you have to realize that whenever a person stands in front of me and I minister to them and they want healing, what I'm doing is this. To be very honest with you, and this, I have to say it's just right because Christians are so picky about how you say things. I, when a person stands in front of me, the person matters. I want them healed, and I know if they don't get healed, then they're going to die. And so obviously they matter, but in the fact of them getting healed, they don't matter. They don't count. Whenever I stand, when a person stands in front of me, the only two beings that count at that point is me and that devil that's hurting them. And the person is just the battleground. They are the oppressed prisoner of war. My job is to beat that enemy and set that person free. So. I'm representing God, so he's with me, and I'm fighting an enemy. And that person, who they are, what they are, what they believe, what they say, all that doesn't matter one bit. We have to just, we just realize that it is warfare. You say, well, I've never heard anything like this. I know it. It hadn't been taught in over 70 years. Uh, Dr. Lake taught it, and whenever he passed away, it pretty much died with him. But now, we're bringing it back, and it's working. And I guarantee you, there are people in your very city right now that are purposely trying to keep you from hearing this message. And they're saying, no, we don't want to hear anything about that DHT stuff because, you know, do you, now think, why would they not want you to hear it? Even if it's wrong, they'd want you to investigate it so you'd know it's wrong. But they don't want you to hear it because then they might have to actually change. So, well, ran out of time again this way. I tell you, 30 minutes flies, especially when you're having fun and I have a good time killing sacred cows. So, we're going to... In this week, pray for you real quick. In the name of Jesus, right now, you be healed. Body, right now, you respond to the voice of the Word of God. You be healed now in Jesus' name. Now, right now, you begin to do what you couldn't do before. Whatever it is, you begin to do it. And as you begin to move, the pain will go. Just like Jesus said, stretch forth the withered arm. And the man did, and he was healed. So you got to begin to move. And then as soon as you can move, you write us and let us know. Give us a testimony. Let us know what God's doing in your life. Let us know if you like the program. If you like it, tell your friends. See you this time next week. In the meantime, remember this, deep theology, if you ain't doing it, you ain't doing it. So go do it, in Jesus' name. God bless you.